We are almost there, my liege. Are you all right? Yes, thanks to you, my old friend. If not for your help back there, I would have... Nonsense, my liege. You are the one who led us here. You are the one who made all this possible. No, this was, and still is, a collective effort of all of us, from lowliest peasants to greatest warriors and scholars. I am but the last of the great procession of people who undertook this journey. But the end is finally in sight. Can you feel it? Our fate is finally within our grasp. All we have to do is push on this one last time. It's just a shame that I'm the one standing here today. Our people deserve a true hero, not a trembling weakling like myself. Then let me come with you. Let others come with you, your guards, your soldiers. We will gladly all lay down our lives for success of this mission. I know, and I appreciate your willingness to do so, but no matter how much you or anyone else may wish to help, the truth is that I have to do this alone, and you know it fully well. I just... what if you're wrong? What if we were all wrong from the very start? Nothing. Whether our story is a mistake or not, we have to bring it, in our own personal tales, to an end anyway. Mine will end right here, one way or another. But yours? You, my friend, are here because your role may be even more vital than mine. That chronicle of yours, the one I asked you to prepare, use it in everything else we learned to make them understand. Make them see why we traveled so far and wide. Explain to them why we committed the acts we did. In a way, you hold the fate of our people in our hands as well. Only difference is that I hold an uncertain future, while you can set our past in stone to serve as a warning for future generations, if nothing else. Now go. Go, and don't look back. I understand. I will not fail you, my liege. I know you won't, old friend. I just wish I could say the same to you as well. What would you do if you knew you were going to die? Perhaps this is a wrong question. After all, we're all going to pass away sooner or later, and unless we become gods ourselves, this will never change. But what would you do if you knew when you're going to die? And what's more, it wouldn't just be you. Everyone you knew, everything you worked for would perish alongside you. Your entire people, your civilization itself would simply cease to exist. What would you do then? Would you accept your fate and enjoy what time you and yours still had left? Or would you accept it and try to leave something memorable for those who would come after you? That way, even though that you may vanish from this world, your memory would still live on. Or perhaps you'd rage and fight with all your might against fate, sparing no expenses to escape your foretold end. Who knows, maybe your answer would be something completely different. Ah, but I once again get ahead of myself. You'll have to excuse this odd habit of mine. After all, these warts you now witness are supposed to be a chronicle, so I should at least try to describe all that happened to us chronologically, from start to finish. Problem is, this particular story has no beginning, at least not the one that I can tell you about, for that knowledge perished many generations ago, and only unverifiable scraps remain today. Still, I'll do my best to establish the story as it was. You probably know of my people, for we have many names. Children of Akatan, Sea Nomads, Brass Thunderers, or Mad Pagan Invaders. Some of our nicknames are less flattering than others, but not necessarily undeserved. But while most of you know us by that first name, Children of Akatan, we are not actually from there. As proud as we are with our magnificent capital city, it is not where our ancestors came from. Instead, they came from an ancient Mayan empire that, in its prime, spanned across Central America. As for that empire, its beginning is lost to time. Who founded it and when, we can't really tell, but it doesn't really matter. After all, the old empire is gone. 
It has been gone for ages now, and neither you nor we have seen it in its prime. When first travellers from Europe arrived, the downfall already happened, and instead of one united nation, our people were a weak collection of fragmented tribes and city-states, barely resembling their powerful and prosperous ancestors from before. The fall? It took everything from them, just as it did from us. But while they accepted their fate, we did not. As for the old empire itself and its fall, as I said, we know very little of it, but I did my best to compile what few reports we had, in order to understand how and why it all collapsed. What I can tell for sure is that our ancestors inhabited Central America for many generations, but the main seat of their power was Yucatan Peninsula. There, our forefathers built great cities and filled them with magnificent pyramids, temples dedicated to gods who allowed them to thrive. The peninsula was united into a single nation, connected by well-maintained roads, a place where law and order were enforced by a single leader, a place where people stood united and prospered under careful gaze of our kings and our gods and our priests, their earthly servants. But our gods, as it happened, were not as benevolent as we thought, and their priests hid a dark secret from the eyes of general population. A stone circle that depicted the cycle of life and death was stored in the greatest temple in Chichen Itza, an artifact that told the story of our people as it happened over and over again. It began with spring, in which small disjointed tribes would unite into a mighty empire. It then continued into summer, a golden age in which our people would prosper and spread their influence and culture far and wide by either conquering or assimilating other tribes. Then came the autumn, in which fruits of that expansion were enjoyed. Great cities would be built, filled with great architectural wonders and monuments to the gods. But then the winter would come and turn it all to dust. The empire would collapse, mirroring the nature itself. The tribes would break apart and death, brought by the same gods who gave us life, would sweep the land, leaving behind only silence and handful of scattered survivors who would make it into next spring. As for all those who would perish during the winter, their souls would be taken by the gods into their own realm, where they would strengthen our pantheon for another cycle. No wonder then that this knowledge was hidden from us. After all, if people knew that all their hard work would be erased within few generations, then they would either give up all hope and abandon their work, or, perhaps more likely, they would try to break this cycle of death and rebirth. But that, of course, was something that our priests could not allow to happen, for, at the end of the cycle, the Empire had to be strong and its people numerous. Otherwise, the gods would not be able to take enough energy from their souls during winter and would perish themselves, plunging the world into an endless darkness in which no life could ever re-emerge. And so, the cycles went on, no one can tell for how long. One empire rose only to fall, and then another one would emerge upon its ashes. The gods were appeased. The wheel turned. Until one day, when the now legendary scholar King of Itza, one who built the greatest empire of them all, stormed into the temple, cast out the priest, and showed his people the stone circle that presented true nature of their existence. The scholar king stood there and screamed truth at his people, trying to convince them to break the wheel, to abandon the cursed land of our ancestors and flee with him, to a place where people were not subject to whims of bloodthirsty gods who hid behind benevolent masks. But it was already too late. It was late autumn by then, and the cold breath of winter was already felt on the wind. Despite Scholar King's pleads, despite his desperate arguments, the downfall would come again. Months went by and, one by one, outer cities broke away from the nation. Armies were sent by the king to re-establish order, and they marched into now dark jungles, only to vanish in them without a trace. Cities that were once hearts of commerce and culture suddenly ceased all communications and vanished as well, and, on rare occasions when they were found, they were empty, devoid of all life and already overgrown by jungle, as if they were abandoned for hundreds of years. The once prosperous empire fell apart, and no one knew why. Was it because of civil war, a disease, some natural disaster? Whatever the reason was, though, the downfall was complete when the king vanished as well. 
and with him a group of wisest scholars and most powerful warlords. The end was within sight. But not all was lost for the Scholar King, despite being gone, probably taken away by vengeful gods for trying to break their cycle, still cared for his people. Despite not having a family himself, the king adopted a great many nobles as his sons and heirs, officially making them a royal family of Itza. By then, most of them were lost as well, but a handful still remained, and they had a plan that could save what little was left of the Empire and its people. As the Scholar King said, the land they inhabited was cursed, and so they had to leave it once and for all and start again somewhere else. A new spring city that would not be subjected to whims of gods. To do that, royal sons gathered everyone who was willing to listen and marched south crossing now hostile jungles and lands of rebellious city-states to reach the edge of great water. There, they unveiled their plan. They would cross the great salt water and look for salvation in a land far beyond it. This plan must have sounded like complete madness to the Mayan refugees, but before their doubts made them abandon all hope, royal sons presented means to achieve their goal. The Scholar King prepared a design beforehand, a design that would save them all, one of a great floating pyramid made solely out of wood that could be used to travel the great unknown and survive the tempestuous winds and waves. Now, it just had to be built. With a goal in front of them, the people set off to work. Jungles were cut down to provide materials, and soon the shoreline was bustling with construction sites, as a great number of these floating pyramids had to be built to take all refugees away. But it was not an easy task. Food was hard to come by, as all agriculture was left behind. But also, other city-states found the hard-working refugees to be an easy target. Raids began, and as weeks and months went by, more and more construction sites were abandoned as royal subjects were either enslaved, killed, or sacrificed to the gods. But it was not yet the end of troubles. The new, self-appointed King of Itza, what little was left of it, heard of these refugees and royal sons who guided them, and decided to remove them to secure his claim, as if such things even mattered anymore. Regardless, he managed to collect a massive army and marched south, forcing royal Mayan subjects to finally commit to the plan. If they stayed, they would all die, for there was no way they could survive the battle. But there was another issue. There simply wasn't enough floating pyramids to house everyone, and so many refugees had to be left behind. A number of royal sons, roughly half of them, volunteered to lead them along the shore in hopes of avoiding incoming army. Some stayed, and fought a hopeless, delaying battle against the incoming foes. The rest took all supplies and people they could fit on their pyramids and went off to sea, knowing full well that they would never see their brothers and sisters and their homeland again. But the deed was done. Thirty massive wooden constructions were launched to the sea, where they began their journey towards the setting sun. A period that we also know very little about, save for the fact that it was not the end of troubles for our people. The gods of thunder and wind followed them, and it wasn't long before First Pyramid drifted away and disappeared amongst endless waves. On other ones, refugees who were unaccustomed to the sea suffered from sickness, and even those who were strong enough to endure it had to live in near constant hunger, as gardens on each pyramid simply couldn't provide enough food for everyone, and it would be a long time before anyone learned how to catch oceanic fish. But the greatest enemy was the world itself. Storms and erratic winds hid this caravan of refugees, and each time they left it smaller, reducing already low hopes of terrified survivors. How long this journey lasted? We cannot say. Was it a year, two, or a decade? No one knows today, but in the end, five last surviving floating pyramids gently stopped in shallow waters of what we now know as the floating city of Akatan. The survivors rushed ashore, less than half of original crews of these five vessels, and were astounded to find a land much different to the one they had left, a cold, windswept highland covered by sparse vegetation. It looked inhospitable when compared to home, but that did not matter. They were finally out of the sea, and the long escape was over, but celebrations were cut short by the realization of just what situations the refugees were in. 
There were but a handful of them, records say that only around 4,000. They were away from home in a foreign, unknown land, and their families and friends who were left behind were most probably long dead by now. What's worse, of all the royal sons, only one survived the journey, making him the last guiding light for all those refugees. But it was then, when the true heart of Akatan, a new home, was born. Seeing that his people were still shaken, the last royal son, now king, told his people what to do. Yes, they were forced to flee their homeland. Yes, they had to abandon it to darkness, but that did not mean that their home was lost forever. It was up to them, the handful of survivors, to rebuild, to prove that the cycle can be broken, and then to return home and free our people from the wheel once and for all. The refugees would have to work hard, they would have to re-establish an empire here in this foreign land, master it, and then find a way to go back. They would have to bring power and wisdom with them to serve as an example for all those who abandoned hope and were forced to relieve the cycle forever. The first, most difficult step was already taken. The vengeful gods were left behind, and refugees had a base of operation, five wooden pyramids that would become the floating city of Akatan our new home, a new heart of our summer empire, and a seat of power whose will would see the wheel of fate broken once and for all. Of course, knowing that something needs to be done and actually being able to do it are two completely separate things, and as people of Akatan quickly learned, many issues still stood ahead of them. The first one, for instance, was the question about the main reason for their exile. The refugees abandoned their homes and fled to a different land, but that did not mean that their curse was broken. The gods, after all, could easily follow them into this new land and exact their vengeance, or even bring chaos and death with them. As such, two groups emerged amongst the exiles. First one, led by the king himself, claimed that influence of the gods should be eliminated, temples should not be built, and sacrifices should not be made in order to, in a way, hide their presence from vengeful deities. The second group, however, believed that after receiving this second chance at life, people of Akatan should work extra hard to appease their gods instead, going so far that the very first child born in the new colony was sacrificed on a stone altar. Other long-forgotten traditions and rituals would have to be uncovered, and spiritual purity should take precedence over anything else, to ensure that the curse would never follow them across the ocean. And these groups, although founded on the very first days of Akatan's existence, remained at odds with each other for generations and enforced an uneasy status quo, which turned these battered exiles into cautious, fearful warshippers who, through gritted teeth, sank praises of powers that annihilated their home. But more pragmatic problems quickly overshadowed theological debates. The most important one was the state of the land the exiles found themselves in. While their home was a lush, green and warm land of jungles, teeming with animals and vegetation, the area they landed in could not be more different from that. Instead of lowland jungles, the area was covered by windy hills, overgrown by evergreen forests and separated by valleys that looked like seas of grass. Further inland, though, the hills became more and more uneven, and soon gave way into ominous, looming mountains covered in snow all year long. But as new buildings were constructed along the shoreline, the people of Akatan realized that, as time went by, that snow crept towards them, slowly but surely. The land, as it turned out, followed the cycle of death and rebirth as well, and on a far greater scale than back home. On the Yucatan Peninsula, arrival of winter meant stronger winds, heavy rains and storms, but even on coldest days the temperature was still mild. In this new land, however, arrival of winter meant that everything – plants, animals, forests, rivers and even sea itself – would freeze into a stupor, as the world itself was covered by an unending, freezing blanket of snow. It wasn't long before people of Akatan shivering near their hastily built fireplaces, realized that their traditional loincloths and tunics would not be enough to survive such severe conditions. During that first winter, hope has died almost completely as many souls perished in their freezing homes, and only decisive action of the king kept the colony from collapsing. 
The arrival of spring, however, was a mixed blessing. Most of the fields established in the early days after landfall were gone, as plants brought from home were unable to survive such harsh conditions. And those precious few crops that managed to survive the biting cold would not be enough to sustain everyone as the land, despite its deceptive green hills and valleys, was simply not fertile enough to grow pretty much anything. It was only the experience gained during their long journey across the Great Water that allowed freezing refugees to gather food from completely different source, the near unlimited skulls of fish that inhabited waters around Akatan, that soon became the major food source for the expanding colony. But the most important issue was of course not the land and not the gods, but the people themselves. It quickly became obvious that, despite difficult climate and poor soil, the area around Akaton was not uninhabited. Groups of locals were spotted on the horizon in the very first month after landing, but they never came close enough to establish any sort of contact. At first, these mysterious mountain people were regarded with fear and awe, as many of them seemed to ride some kind of beasts that enabled them to move much faster than even the best of Akatani hunters. The locals would continue to observe the growing town for another three years without taking any action, never approaching close enough to establish any contact. But after those three years, despite all odds, Akatan not only managed to survive, but, under wise guidance of the king, began expanding into neighboring areas. Soon, first villages were established outside of the floating city, mostly as bases for hunters and animal herders, and soon people from one such village encountered tracks left by one of the local scout groups. A squad of hunters followed them, and after a few days found a fortified village, a clear sign that, whoever these locals were, they were not just simple-minded barbarians. Both excited and scared about this discovery, the hunters retreated and reported the location of this place to the king himself, who, eager to understand his new neighbors, personally led a diplomatic expedition, despite protests of the priests and some of his advisors. But the king has already decided, and few days later, after marching across the hills, a column of almost 200 Akatani soldiers and officials arrived at the hill next to the village. The situation was tense. The locals, clearly surprised by sudden arrival of so many armed men, armed themselves, but in order to alleviate their fears, the king took only a small group of his most trusted advisors and approached the earthworks without escort. Once close, his people stepped forward and left gifts, golden ornaments and figures carved out of bone and stone, in the grass in front of the hamlet. Then, they retreated and observed reaction. At first, there was none, but after realizing that these new arrivals were not openly hostile, local warlord marched out from his fortifications with a small retinue, took the gifts, which quite clearly left an impression, especially ones made out of gold, and left some trinkets in return before falling back. A small exchange, but it bode well for the future. Over the next days, first cautious meetings took place in the open area between the village and Akatani camp, and although linguistic barrier caused some immense problems, both sides at the very least understood the idea of respectful gifts. Slowly, day by day, both sides learned more and more about each other, and soon first trade deals were struck, causing both groups to finally stop looking at each other with mistrust and approach each other openly especially as they realized that both sides could profit from cooperation. When the delegation returned, the King of Akatan sent a group of his stonemasons and architects to the village, as the locals were quite clearly impressed by imposing stone walls and buildings that were constructed around the floating city in just few short years. And in return, a small group of natives came back to Akatan, bringing with them the knowledge of two secrets previously unknown to the refugees. The first one was horse breeding. Those mysterious, dangerous-looking beasts that locals used to ride around turn out to be not some mythological monsters. Instead, they were just animals bred for both work and for war, and their introduction greatly increased productivity of the colony. What's more, these beasts allowed scouts, hunters, and, perhaps most importantly, soldiers, to move around much faster, which opened up a myriad of strategic and tactical possibilities, a fact most eagerly noted by Akatan's minuscule armed forces. 
And the second secret was that of ironworking. One of the very first things noticed by diplomatic delegation was a very peculiar shape of weapons carried by the local chieftain and his retinue of warriors. While Mayan warriors mostly wielded weapons made out of stone or hardened wood, which were nothing more than primitive clubs, the natives carries with them dangerous slashing weapons made out of metal and capable of cutting clean through leather armor, cloth, tissue and bone alike. The difference in quality was breathtaking, and so, after long negotiations, two blacksmiths were given a residence in Akatan, where they would teach their metalworking craft to the colonists. And it was a knowledge that could not only be used for war, but also during peace, as it provided the exiles with a great many new tools and ways to use them, even more increasing the prosperity of their new home. And so it was that remnants of Mayan Empire established first contact with the native inhabitants of this foreign land. Yet, that single village was just a beginning. The people that inhabited, the Ainu as they called themselves, were far more numerous than Akatani exiles, but just like Mayans of old, the locals were not united. In theory, they were ruled by a single high chieftain, but in truth their people were divided into dozens of smaller tribes, constantly at odds with each other as they sought to expand their power. But, as often is the case, sudden appearance of a unified group completely shook the scene. Over the next two decades, more and more tribes established contact with Akatan, as many chieftains hoped to use knowledge possessed by these newcomers mostly stoneworking and architecture, to gain an advantage over their rivals. Others, however, were less subtle in their pursuits of power, and before first decade of Akatan's existence came to pass, Mayan exiles had to clash with northern Ainu tribes at least a dozen times in order to protect their new home from being razed to the ground. And while Mayans were eventual victors of these conflicts, they also showed just how backwards their military was when compared to the natives. Horse raiders ran circles around Akatan militia units, while their warriors easily cut through light wooden shields and cloth armor with their metal weapons. If not for some brilliant strategic maneuvers orchestrated by King and his war chiefs, Akatan would have fallen during this first decade. Instead, by using ambushes and by slowly walking out Ainu tactics, the exiles managed to beat the raiders back and even captured some of the villages and towns along the coast, greatly expanding their power base. But it was also then when first major conflict between King's faction and the priests arose. The shamans demanded that these newly conquered people should be sacrificed as an offering to the gods, not just to appease them, but also because these natives worshipped heretical idols unknown to Mayan pantheon. The king, however, objected, not only on religious grounds, he also argued that these people were needed to ensure Akatan's survival. Clever tactics and luck might have saved them up until now, but should the Ainu band together against the new arrivals, the exiles would not survive the ensuing fight. And so, local tribes were assimilated, teached Mayan ways, and in return, they became citizens of a rapidly growing regional power. Other tribes were conquered and assimilated as well, but, to surprise of many, some of the Ainu chieftains approach Akatan themselves, willing to become part of it, no doubt convinced by the king, who was renowned as a silver-tongued diplomat. Or, perhaps, they realized that their disjointed tribes stood no chance against the growing might of the Mayans, and decided that trading their independence for safety was a better alternative, especially since the king of Akatan allowed his new subjects to retain their culture as well as their religion. They simply had to add a handful of new gods into their already existing pantheon. 52 years after landfall, in the year 1443, Akatan was no longer a solitary town of survivors. After many diplomatic deals, dozens of raids and one major conflict, the new nation controlled two-thirds of Ainu territory and could muster thousands of warriors in times of need. But that growth finally caused a reaction. The remaining Ainu chieftains banded together under a single high chief and formed a united front against invaders from across the ocean. They launched many raids along the coast, attacking isolated villages and causing chaos wherever they went. The king of Akatan, who was already growing old by this time, sent his son at the head of an army to deal with those raids and to, hopefully, push the attackers back into their remaining towns and capture them once and for all. 
but unfortunately, this time luck was on the side of independent Ainu. Their force ambushed expedition sent from Akatan, and although Mayans and their Ainu allies managed to beat back this attack, the king's son lost his life in the process, which meant that the only remaining heir was his young, 14-year-old sister. Realizing that his time on this earth is coming to an end, the king sent messages to all of his chieftains, imploring them to raise as many forces as possible and capture remaining Ainu territory, so that his daughter could rule in peace and focus on their true mission. The response arrived shortly. 8,000 men were raised, including a 1,000 horsemen, truly a force to be reckoned with, and sent west to avenge death of their prince and to finally unite Area under one banner. The first true conflict in history of Akaton has begun, but at this point it was a one-sided battle. The Ainu chieftains gathered all warriors they could muster and armed every available farmer, and still their forces were severely outnumbered. The Allied army, on the other hand, not only counted both warriors from Akatan and their Ainu comrades, it was also led by commander of the Royal Guard himself, a man who knew how to fully utilize his light forces that, at the time, were still mostly equipped with stone and wooden weapons, as new metal ones proved to be difficult and expensive to produce. The Allies quickly realized that their strength in this particular conflict lied in numbers. While most of the levied independent Ainu warriors were just as poorly equipped as Akitani army, their war chiefs and their retinues caused serious damage to Mayan troops, who were unable to withstand deadly slashes of their iron swords. So, instead of one pitched battle, Akatan forces launched dozens of smaller raids, attacking isolated Ainu positions and bleeding them in preparation for the final engagement. What's more, the Allies also realized that, despite wielding superior weapons, Ainu forces were very limited when it came to personal armor, and even more so, native warrior culture meant that almost no one in the independent army carried shields which made them vulnerable to slingers, javelin men and archers that Mayans used en masse in their guerrilla tactics. And the locals had no way to retaliate against these skirmishers, since they were now protected by Akatan's own horsemen. The raids lasted for over a week, as two armies looked for an advantageous place for a decisive battle, and were mostly won by forces from Akatan. In the end, though, both hosts met each other in a valley on the western side of the island, but Ainu forces were already depleted from previous days, and the battle was over within an hour. In a defiant move, the war chief leading the independent army gathered all of his best warriors at his side and charged right at the Mayan commander, hoping to cut off his enemy's head but his assault group was met by a hail of arrows, javelins and stones, while the rest of his forces were surrounded by club-wielding warriors and butchered almost to the last man. The Ainu warchief and his warriors still managed to reach Akatani lines though, and they killed many levies located there, but their rampage was finally stopped when allied horsemen crashed into their flank. Most of the retinue was killed, but the war chief and a handful of his closest companions were captured and sent to the floating city itself, where the priests had them sacrificed on an altar of Nakon, the god of war. The levies, however, were disarmed and sent back to their homes, homes which would soon become part of the kingdom of Akatan. For, after the battle was over, the rest of the war was pretty much just a formality. Upon hearing about the annihilation of his forces, the last Ainu high chief barricaded himself and his remaining warriors in a fortified town on the western coast, but it was only a matter of time before it was surrounded, and although several breakaway raids were attempted, the defenders were soon forced to either give up or starve to death. The gates were opened, and the last stronghold of independent Ainu fell to the forces of Akatan, and the king himself travelled west, despite his old age, to triumph his victory. The Ainu high chief, together with his family and chieftains who aided them, were sacrificed on the altar of Kukulkan, the great feathered war serpent, right in the middle of their own town, in front of their own people, to serve as a warning. But the commoners themselves were left unharmed. The town was not pillaged, the temples were not burned, and Akatan even sent healers and relief supplies to make sure its new subjects would get back on their feet as quickly as possible. The war was won. 
The first step of building an empire was successful, the lands of the Ainu were united, and Akatan stood as an unopposed power in the area. Or so it seemed. The gods, as it happened, were not yet done punishing us, and their vengeance arrived soon under new foreign banners moving in from the south.